posted that on Discord. Uh, this Friday would be the date where at least everybody should have committed to one project. Because of course, the whole point of this class is for us to really be doing this in a context of a very specific idea. It might not be the earth shattering idea that you've always been excited about. That's not what matters. What matters is that you focus your energies on a specific question and for the rest of the class, really commit to it. This is something that you will always have with you, whether how much to commit a given amount of resources or capabilities or your interest. The purpose is to pick something and dive deep because we're more interested in the process of how you do this rather than the final result. Uh, I had a request from a few people uh, of thinking about just doing more in-depth case studies. And of course, I picked full scope for today to kind of tell you all the untold story of full scope. So this will be very informal. We'll record it. I'll then think about how much of it I should actually say on camera or not. <laughs> but I want to be very honest in how that process has gone and where we are going with that object. So it will be a fun exercise for myself, but also use this uh, to what I will describe uh, of the purpose. The hidden message in this talk is really how to build communities around projects. So if you take away one thing, I mean, of course, we will talk about the technical details of this, but the meta lesson to take away from here is how to build global communities around ideas and the challenge of uh, ownership of what do you what is the core that you contribute what is the core that other people contribute how does that work and feel in terms of uh, your level of comfort in projects becoming global i mean if you get that opportunity to begin with which is also non-trivial people are online oh i just have to share screen so just give me one second for the folks connecting online. Um, okay, I'm assuming you all heard what I just said, uh, but if not, uh, this would be the, uh, what I've been calling the untold story of full scope. Uh, we will take a little bit of a break in the talk itself. And act, how many of you have actually built the full scope? Person, okay, so we will take a little moment to actually build, you both have built full scope. Uh, I will walk through uh, a little bit of a box of history, just so you all know the progression of an idea itself. Uh, and then we will spend some time also learning a little bit what you can do with this tool. And in the very end, we'll talk about community. This is very informal. You should interrupt me at any point of time. And then uh, don't open these objects as yet, but since many of you haven't actually played directly the full scope, you also do your very first full scope. Uh, and the thing that I just passed you is, uh, is a microscope. But if you look at this picture, I mean, I'm assuming most of you know this famous painting that this is not a pipe. The reason I wanna evoke this notion is sometimes when I say the word microscope, there is an image that evokes in your head. And often enough in design and in when you're thinking about solutions, we often start with the assumptions that other people make. And the purpose of frugal science or thinking about just problem solving is to not be limited by assumptions other people make. So in the context of microscopy, the really fundamental assumptions people had made in the history of science, um, and I'm assuming, let me ask this question as a quiz. Uh, so most of you have known the history of microscopy from the context of, of course, you know, glasses and eye correcting glasses is the history of optics, where optics first started. Uh, then came uh, the bits around people starting to realize and think about telescopes. And of course, microscopy came around that same time, which is, you know, uh, 1600, uh, 1650. Uh, there were two types of microscopes at that time, historically. 
One was called a simple microscope and the other one was called compound microscope. Uh, simple microscopes only had one objective. So if you think about light and remember the frugal optics class, you only have two glass surfaces to bend light or manipulate light and compound microscopes where there were a sequence of lenses, you all now through the frugal optics class, you remember your objective lens, your telescope, uh, your eyepiece lens, if you have an eyepiece or a lens that is projecting it on a sensor. And actually, Monday, sorry, yes. quick question. What is, what is it, why is it called an objective? What is an objective <laughs> definition? Like? Yeah, objective is just literally the very first optical piece that will be close to an object. Mm -hmm. And so whatever the front piece is, ironically now, if I was to cut an objective, which we had around, it's expensive. They cost, you know, all the way to tens of thousands of dollars or $50,000. It's because it will have literally 30 or 40 different lenses in it. And it's compacted together to be called an objective. The reason they're expensive is, I think I mentioned this in the frugal science lecture, is that you have to align. It's not just the cost of the lens itself, or the smoothness, but every little alignment matters if you have many. So the, the quiz is, uh, there were these two classes of microscopes that were around, uh, and this is, I'm talking about Leeuwenhoek's time. We will talk about Leeuwenhoek a little bit in a second and kind of the historic context to what we do now. Uh, and so what do you think amongst the best resolution? Now you all know what a resolution is. What would be the highest resolution? Compound microscopes where you have lots of surfaces and you can bend light and do many things with light or simple microscopes where you only have two surfaces. What would give you better resolution? Forget about the cost, forget about anything. Just resolution implying you could see more like, for example, if I care about watching bacteria uh, and you are in an era you know, around 1650, Example. This is when Robert Hooke was alive, and he was literally at the Royal Society writing. I mean, some of you know the famous book Micrographia, which was the very first book on microscopy, the very first time uh, some of the uh, documents of the church had drawings of bees that were representative of the actual bees, or his famous painting that was drawn from microscopy of the flea. Uh, so, any guesses? on who do you, which way would you put your vote? What would have better resolution? Simple microscopes or compound microscopes? The question is either one lens or many lenses. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a historic question. Mm -hmm. oh, if, simple. huh? Yeah, because I'm posing it as a trick question. <laughs> Intuitively, you would choose. I mean, intuitively, you should say compound lenses because I have, and of course, in if you don't have many optical surfaces, you are uh, you cannot do the kinds of corrections. You cannot do chromatic corrections, for example, in simple objectives, because every wavelength bends differently. Remember, we talked about the soldiers marching. If the soldiers are marching at a different frequency, you all know the angle of refraction is dependent on wavelength, and that's why you should start seeing an object with new colors arriving, because they will also the the reason thing compound lenses do is correct for that, where you can build a surface that there will be no chromatic aberration, false colors will not arrive. So historically, what's fascinating in the microscopy is that we were not good at making lenses. So the more you added, the picture kept getting blurrier and blurrier. So although mathematically, people were so convinced that compound microscopes is the only way to make microscopes, because they were borrowing history of telescopes there happened to be a fabric seller and you know going back to frugal science and citizen science i would call him the very first although there have been in the history of science many citizen scientists he would be the most famous citizen scientist of literally multiple centuries which also he's the father of microbiology which is Leeuwenhoek. he started playing with single objectives which is the the microscope you have in your hand is a single objective microscope uh, and the irony is, which is sad, is because of the simplicity of his design, nobody believed him. 
for the 50 years of his life, he was relegated to the past, although he was the very first person, if you think about it, to really describe single celled organisms, which were called animalcules. He was the very first person to watch a bacteria. He was the very first person to describe the reproductive process, see the sperm, very first person to host of the protists. Literally anything that he touched, anything that he touched, he was making discoveries. This is recorded in around 200 or so letters that he wrote to the Royal Society. And ironically, and again, going back to openness in science, there is also a lesson here. He was extremely secretive of the object he did all of this with. So he would be very open to describing these discoveries, but he never told anybody what he was using. Let's see, I happen to have it at home, but I'm assuming most of you have seen the famous Leeuwenhoek microscope. No? Okay, I'm just going to pop that picture just for one second if you guys haven't. Uh, uh, let me just, and again, it's, uh, um, at some point of time, we can talk quite a lot about um, many things that Leeuwenhoek did and sort of the his text. Uh, there only remain something like, so that's the object that we are looking at. Uh, there only remain very few replicas of the original object. This is in Delft, and uh, many of them were lost to fire. Another thing that he used to do, which is very peculiar, is he would make a microscope per sample and then never remove the sample. So he was perfecting the objective for that object, not knowing any optics, not knowing literally, I mean, he was essentially an untrained person. He could tell when you see something, whether something is good or bad, but knowing no optics at all, as far as people know, as far in the history. And only tweaking his objectives, it still remains a mystery of how he built his objective. I will tell you about how we make whole scopes uh, very specifically. But I wanted to make this comment around uh, uh, this notion of uh, assumptions. So, you know, you can go in and literally the Royal Society letters are filled with his discoveries. And this is literally the very first description of bacteria, for example. Uh, you were to go in in his letters uh, all the way from salt crystals to fungus. He just ended up anything that he touched. So this is that famous figure of uh, the description, not only of shapes and forms, but also of motility. Uh, I have his original uh, book of the entire letters translated in my office, if people are interested. Uh, I mean, I think one of the ironic part about this is, uh, you know, being on the frontier, you literally, this was the very first description of sperm, for example, uh, plant cross sections. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, what he was describing in some sense, uh, so this is, I think, a grain of salt. He was describing crystals, uh, much of what you would now associate with entire fields, he was the first person to see. Uh, now a lesson to learn in that context and kind of knowing this history is that it took around 30, 40 years of him persistently describing something and people trying to replicate and not being able to replicate what he did. There was a sense of uh, uncertainty or uh, uh, because he was not a trained scientist, he didn't write in Latin, he wrote very old uh, uh, Dutch, which was even hard even to decipher and read at this current moment. Uh, nobody believed him until the amount or the volume of evidence rose to a certain extent. And in the very end, in the last years of his life, he was inducted into the Royal Society as the only untrained person who had not gone through this classic university exercise. And ironically, he died without sharing his and for the next 50 to, I would say, 70 years, nobody was able to achieve his proficiency in making these microscopes. So ironically, the dark history of science and the dark history of microbiology is the fact that imagine if he was a person who was willing to tell others what he did. But because early on, he was so kept as an outsider, uh, he felt very 
that I think he describes in his memoirs, and I'll tell you what we are trying to do with the history of Lee Hook as well. He describes that I am yet to meet an eager enough or a passionate individual who would really understand the depth of uh, and the hard work that it takes to do what he was doing. I mean, he's the first person who described blood flow, the very first person to see blood cells, very first person to start making these associations with uh, what we are drinking, thinking about a lot of things about <laughs> food. And he didn't believe that there is anybody like him that is as passionate and hence he didn't share. The other part, which is what most people believe is the fact that he felt that this is his superpower. If he lets go of this, others will be able to do the same thing and nobody would care. And I, this is the unfortunate reality, ironically, in science. We still have this notion that many science is not replicable because people find something and then they believe if they don't share it, they really have a horse that they can keep running. He died and most of these microscopes uh, were passed on to people who didn't understand what those objects were. Most of them were lost in fire. It's believed there are a handful of them still accessible and people have tried to replicate uh, some of that work. But we basically had the next 70 years where nobody could actually get that resolution until compound microscopes started picking back up again. So this is the background history. And I think the reason I wanna go back and of course, at some point of time, uh, we can talk a lot about some of the political context. Uh, uh, I'm writing something about just Leeuwenhoek's history as a fictional piece, as a commentary on science, where I pretend if Leeuwenhoek had disciples, like which was tradition at that time, and what would have happened to science. And so, you know, it's a fictional piece, but I'm using that fictional piece to kind of make a commentary that we should reflect on ourselves. There is a big lesson in that, the fact that it was probably, I would say, the most discovery, the most important discovery of the century for multiple centuries. And it was uh, not possible to report, uh, replicate it. While of course, diseases after diseases were primarily based on much context of microscopy. Uh, so in that background, uh, one of the things when almost 10 years ago when I started my lab, you know, 2011, uh, I had taken a trip out to the field and we were at that time working on rabies. So now I'm relegating back to the story of Old School. Rabies is very interesting because uh, if you think about it, uh, you, trans you get it monkeys and dogs and the primary, I had spoken to a couple of people at WHO, the primary way that you still really detect it is through antibodies in the organism that bit you. So it's a little bit tricky, first of all, to think about that there are certain symptoms, but to really have an affirmative case, it's actually through samples that are made through brain slices of a dog. And so in uh, Thailand, I got to see that process. And of course, it's quite a tricky situation because not at all places it's possible to vaccinate many of the pets and animals against rabies. And I remember being in a place close to a rainforest where they were doing this detection and it's done through fluorescent antibodies at that time. I think there are a couple other techniques now, but it's still very difficult uh, to detect rabies in animals quickly enough uh, out in the field. And the ironic part there was uh, I remember seeing a Nikon microscope that I have in my lab. It cost $100,000. It was just a regular fluorescent microscope. No reason for it to be so expensive, but relegated in a corner in a field. And the classic problem that's described is a uh, man with the key is missing, which just means as people lock up equipment uh, every place. And at that time, microscopy has always been the in this scenario of something very delicate. That was the other assumption when we started this project, that microscopes are something that you keep very carefully, uh, the fact that uh, they are very expensive and fragile. And when I came back from that trip, I think that was led to this aha moment. I mean, of course we were interested in diagnostics and diseases, but the bigger assumption that I wanted to think about is, you know, what does a microscope actually look like?
I really at? Only think about what a microscope is in this context. And going back to the perspective of frugal science, uh, there was a very broad objective at that time that we decided, and again, uh, there is a lesson in this story associated with uh, how you choose what you're trying to build or design for. And the biggest vision that we had at that time was how we will build a microscope that is the microscope for all, uh, rather than choosing a specific technology, the idea was to choose a price point. And uh, I remember having these conversations both with uh, my graduate student at that time, Jim, who did pick up and join the project. Uh, it's also a little bit about people believing in you at that time, uh, because at that time when we said that, the idea that there will be a, a $1 scope that you can see a single bacteria with, uh, people would often laugh at us uh, to an extent where we couldn't fund this project. I mean, there was, uh, we just tried many people, many organizations, we could not fund this project. Uh, the other ironic thing a little bit going to that type image to remember is the goal was manufacturing. And so this is another very important principle to think about, which I want you to all think in terms of scale. Uh, we two billion kids on this planet. And so the way that we approach this object or microscopy is much more like pencils. So I don't know how many of you know the history of pencils from a design object. It is the time where sort of, you know, fountain ballpoint pens would be another great example. There was a transition point from traditional ink pens and things that are really flimsy, you can't travel with them to a transition into ballpoint pens where it became a writing tool for all. And that was the trying to apply that the fact that, and quite literally, I might find, if I can find online, this notion of what if you walk through a microscope or you drop the microscope a couple of stories, you should still have the objects arrive. And all of these design constraints are going in even before we actually ever built or thought about how to build. And this is kind of what I want you to remember is you have to decouple uh, Shweta was talking about this a little bit. You might have a class of ideas and you might have a problem, but you want to do that coupling uh, at a later stage when you feel confident. Otherwise, you might be narrowing down the ideas. Uh, at that time, the idea that I was excited about is flat manufacturing and thinking about could optics and flat manufacturing be combined to print microscopes. That was our pitch to the NSF. Uh, I wrote many, many proposals that never got funded. The title of those was uh, uh, Printing Optics. Uh, but there was a problem. The problem was, yes, go ahead. So, so the, the challenge of getting funded up, up to this point, the conversation, so I'm assuming it, it, you do have deep conversations with them, they respect you, they respect the yeah. research. Is it about the, they, they're not, they're challenging the impact you're going to have, or the viability of it? Yeah. So it's fascinating you say that you assumed <laughs> that they know me. I'm like a uh, first year assistant professor. Uh, I am at a place that people respect, but ironically that none of that matters. Uh, and you don't get to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people that are on the other side. All they get to see is a one page, two pager, five pager, 10 pager. And I'll tell you what we did to actually fund the project, which was really an aha moment for me in terms of what I often call, you know, full scope is really about experience. The same problem that I'm trying to solve is exactly the problem that I have with many of these program managers who are so far removed from day-to-day -day science. And long story short, uh, we, we built the instrument. I mean, we, we started thinking about origami. I had the first set of a sketches. Uh, we realized very quickly that this space is uh, phenomenal. We, I'll tell you how we solve. There is a fundamental problem in optics of the reason why people believe that it could not be done. It was known at that time that you could use spherical lenses in optical pickups. So literally all of this communication that I'm doing is passing through uh, fiber optics. But when you convert the output of a fiber optics now to an electronic readout, which happens at every router in the world, 
there's actually a ball lens, a spherical micro lens, but it is not for imaging. It is, and people had assumed that these spheres are fantastic for capturing intensity, uh, but they do not have any corrections. And so there will be so many aberrations associated with it. And we challenge that uh, with mathematics. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But going back to this funding to answer your question, after having built the microscopes, and I'll show you some of the very first ones we built, we actually built one for the White House uh, for first Maker Faire uh, for the White House. And the irony was that uh, people were starting to learn about this, but we still had no funding. Uh, and it was getting to a point of desperation. And I remember, I don't know if it was legal at that time or not, but I literally attached a full scope to the application. And instead of using an electronic way of submitting, I submitted the application by mail. And later I got a call from a program manager who said, yeah, I think we get it. <laughs> and we got funding. I mean, it was the very first funds that we got for our lab. It was, but I, I learned a lesson there. I think the lesson really is that any science, any project that you're trying to do, what might be in your head does not transpire through words into what people believe and think about. I think this is, and again, I'm talking about 10 years ago. This is 2011, 2012. Uh, Nobody used to use that word frugal science. And I think by project after project, we have built this notion that simplicity is actually much more powerful sometimes. So it's not something that we could leverage where we could say, oh, we're trying to do the akin of what full scope does for this problem. Uh, and that led to also educating many of our program officers uh, in terms of trying to understand the breadth of what you could do with this idea. Uh, but also having people viscerally feel. And the thing that I wanted to show you all today, so first of all, let me just answer a question about optics and breaking your assumptions when you are starting. And then I'm going to show you, uh, I want to surprise you with what the very first full scope looked like. And it might change your perception of how you think about your projects. Uh, was there a question you had before I jump? Yeah. Just from the scope, how much funding were you? Oh, I was looking for $50,000. That's it trying to fund one graduate student and you can realize how hard this is i mean this is my commentary on our funding situation is the fact that now you know we have reached out around two million people we are trying to scale globally but at the beginning you need just that tiniest of a drop to begin because once the process starts you can demonstrate a capability you can really then show but uh, and especially you know, it's very hard for me to explain what people felt. I can tell you stories of my colleagues of how they reacted that they have just hired an assistant professor who's making paper microscopes. You know, we're at Stanford, you know, we do serious things here, which we do. Uh, but I think there is this conversation you need to have with yourself that as long as you are anchored in a goal, which our goal was to build something that will be literally globally accepted and uh, like toothpaste and toothbrushes and pencils. That's what we wanted to create in that context. And I think that it's non-trivial for people to appreciate. I remember when the PLOS One paper came out, uh, we submitted it to PLOS primarily because uh, it's an open science journal. And I remember reading a friend of mine sending me a text message with a tweet from Bill Gates. And it was written origami microscope are interesting exclamation points. <laughs> so even he, who is embedded in this context, uh, and again, you know, even if you read in a paper to say this is possible, our sense of believing, and again, the most fun part of when we do full scope workshops around the world, like literally while I'm talking, there are hundreds of workshops happening at this very moment. And often enough, the aha moment that people describe is when they are building, they tell you that didn't expect that we are making a microscope, even though you have told us, even if we know from this global data that we are building microscopes. So there is this inherent sense that we have as humans in terms of not trusting unless you've had that experience. And I think this is very important, which we actually take to our advantage, uh, the element of surprise. Because 
in the context of education, if people already have a prediction of what they're about to see, it is something that people are not so excited about. So there is an element of surprise you have to think about. And we celebrate it in many ways. Uh, and that's why the packaging and the object that you're gonna see looks like the way it looks. Let me say one word about optics, which is, this is really the equation that allows us to do, and it took us a year to figure this out. And what this is, is essentially, it's an optimization that we did around apertures. So I had said, when you have spherical lenses, there will be lots of aberrations. You only have two surfaces and people have given up on spherical surfaces and I'll describe why spherical surfaces. So first of all, in optics, shaping a surface is very hard. But if you want higher magnification, it has to be very high curvature. That's even harder because now you have to have uh, the kind of precision uh, to be this at small scale, make, make very sharp surfaces. But there is a common process, uh, which is called how ball bearings are made, which is you take two parallel abrasive plates, you throw random bits of glass in it, and you rotate. I don't know how many of you have actually milled you know how flour is made? Uh, if you start from grains, that's how it's really built. And this process, using the physics of the fact that spheres are smaller and bigger, the bigger sphere will hold more weight between two plates, it will shrink. And effectively, if you tune this gap, you can get perfect spheres. Actually, Stanford has the world record for the most spherical object that has ever been made. I don't know if any of you have actually seen it. You know what I'm talking about? It is actually in the, uh, in the physics building right outside. It was built from similar manufacturing products, uh, but uh, it was used for uh, a space satellite for some inertial uh, measurements. But one of the things about this is that the spheres come for free, but the assumption at that time was if you have a sphere, you will have too many aberrations because there are no parameters. All you get to see is give me a sphere of this radius and nothing else. There is no design to it. And hence you cannot shape light. And what we realized, no, there is actually, when you go back and then I think prove it, but it, I do strongly believe that Leeuwenhoek understood that you could do more things with spheres. And the first thing you can do with a sphere is shave its edges off. Uh, and that's called an aperture. And you will see how we do that in this current manufacturing. Uh, but the way to think about it is throw away the light that is actually causing aberrations. So this term that you see here, if you were to think about this, uh, it's obvious in this picture, this term is a little girdle around. And so if you go and open your packages, I want you to just take a look at this object you will find this little bubble wrap in there. And in that bubble wrap, I want you to pick up, and I'll just show this object to the, uh, there is an object right here. Uh, there's a stack of magnets. You can put this away and you'll find a spherical piece of black uh, piece right there. I'm just gonna show it on the camera so you all know. And in that camera, you're seeing a tiny little hole. And that hole on the surface is what the aperture is. It is smaller than the lens. And then you will also notice now, if you flip it around, that those holes are asymmetrical. It's larger on the side where the object is and smaller on the side. And that is the calculation of an optimal aperture for the two apertures that allows us to get the optimal resolution with a single cell. And again, you know, if you go back to the full scope paper and literally go in the supplementary, there is a three page proof for this. Anybody could have done this since Leeuwenhoek's time. But of course, everybody had this assumption that, oh, we have better ways of making lenses and uh, spherical lenses are not good enough. And I think what we challenged was this notion that if you think hard enough about, and again, it is possible if I have multiple lenses, and I think there are a couple of lens manufacturing processes that we have been working on now that add many layers, 
but literally we can take an object that now costs it's like a sand grain effectively so the the objective the very first lenses that were made in full scope the original full scope the lenses were six ten but because we were adding this aperture we beat every other micro lens at that time because it takes i mean some of these micro lenses are manufactured for your cell phones for example and they use many complex processes and that was the aha moment that is hidden behind what I think from a context of Google science is to really understanding this mathematically of what does that look like. And then we went to town. Then we really played with the notion of design. And this is the hundredth or the 300th version of this. Uh, that's Jim right here. So I think kind of the other aspect of thinking about uh, projects is uh, uh, Jim was a graduate student in my lab. That's a picture taken in Tanzania. And one of the things that we were both very passionate about was we are going to test ideas from manufacturing when we will explore this idea. So I'm now going to open that is called Old Scope History. And I want to show you guys what the very first Old Scope looked like. And you will realize sometimes that, you know, there is a very long journey. Yes. Was there ever a conversation that you had about how to measure the impact of what this is going to have and the ripple effect potentially? Yeah, no, I think that's fascinating. We did all of that afterwards. And I think the way that I think, and at least from a perspective of there is a feeling about you don't know the capability of what you're trying to create. And simultaneously, there are many reasons you can talk yourself out of an idea. And there is a fine balance. So I want you to do the by the numbers, but I also want you to question your own assumptions. And if you strongly believe a technology or capability needs to exist, I think so for me, it was not about having a large impact. It was about, I see around me all the time, why are kids not playing with microscopes? This tool might have failed, that's perfectly okay. We would have taken another design route but that was in a sense that microscopy is so fundamental to my own understanding of this world. That is a capacity I want to exist no matter what. And I think that is an assumption, but it's built on this very strong premise of just my own journey in science. Every single, I, I do this every day. And literally we write papers on discoveries that we make with Foldscope. The, Whenever you start thinking about how something works, there is a microscopic explanation associated with it. Anybody who studied life sciences, it's impossible to imagine how the machinery works, but you can just see it, which I still find ironic. So people who are just on the boundary of getting excited about biology, you give them a microscope and it's an explosive revelation because nature is far more creative then we give it credit for, and that all comes through that window. So I think I'm not saying that you should when you're tackling problems, of course. One of the big problems that we've often been uh, inspired by is infectious diseases, which is what led our work in malaria, our work in schistosomiasis. But all of that was secondary. I think here the point was that could we really deliver the capacity for the world to see bacteria for a price of a dollar? And I think that's what I mean by cost and performance and being uh, almost uh, you know, bullish about that idea. Because in the end, it would have been perfectly okay. I mean, we tried many different ways of thinking about it. It's perfectly okay to give up on your key design principle as long as you're anchored to a question. But that question was not informed from a context of, uh, Know, some numbers, it just always felt right that people should experience science directly. And I think sometimes I would argue in projects, we become too, uh, for the lack of a better word, rational. And it's very easy for a wild idea to just be left uh, because, you know, this is too crazy. And I, I mean, we, we found that in our experience with funders, but uh, at least you have to anchor yourself. Is there a question? Okay, so I'm just gonna, I bought this box for you guys. I have kept it in my office for a while. It's called Old School History. And Manu, should I switch the screen here? Uh, so that this is the main uh, audio? Or are you gonna be here back again? Yeah, I'll go back there. Okay, actually. okay. I'll show the things back there. 
Uh, and I think, you know, it has, it has many different things uh, that I can pass around. But the first thing I want to show you is uh, there is a lesson associated with this. Uh, sometimes when you are thinking about an idea, it is very important to very quickly materialize it. And I think, of course, we are in a course around uh, tinkering and capacity and capabilities. So the very first aha moment for me, which is literally uh, the very first full scope in the world, is actually right here. Uh, it is a matchbox. Uh, and I'll just show you guys uh, right here. I'm sure all of you. Uh, and the aha moment around this was, it's literally a piece of sphere stuck in on a piece of paper. There's no capabilities, you squeeze around, but actually this works. Uh, quickly that started transitioning to objects like these. We started playing with mechanisms. This is the very first mechanism that has a single axis. And again, you know, I think the reason I just want you all to see this is it's extremely important to explore the medium that you're trying very quickly before you're going to perfect anything. You know, optimization is something that you can all do at a later time, but it's not so obvious at that moment. And you have to, you have to imagine what that object can be, but very quickly test a certain set of ideas. And I remember literally sitting with Jim and we built this within a matter of 15 minutes. From I started thinking about origami, we're like, okay, what is the first object that's lying around? And we had this in our hands. And this is one example of the next stage was, okay, let's get serious. That led to a series of full scopes that were made out of file folders. <laughs> At that time, I happened to have a lot of file folders. So this is another example. <laughs> Uh, now you're starting to see a little bit of that sense of what full scope is. It's just, and then you guys can come around and take a look at these objects. I just, I do like to keep them, but it's fun for you to. The only tool that's used here is a little chisel for making the holes in brass uh, and exacto knife. So we're just still cutting them out of pieces of paper and you'll kind of get a sense for uh, what does it mean in terms of without any CAD, without any, you know, no modeling, nothing. Uh, at that time, we got very serious about this part. And I think this is also the transition point. We knew that there is an object here, uh, but we wanted to convince ourselves that we can push the limits on the optics framework. And that's when uh, we spent almost a year just up here. Uh, and I think this is, again, sometimes uh, you can't realize that hidden behind objects that look quite mundane are just these subtle aha moments that you do want to dedicate time and effort to. The, the whole point we know, if you're going to make optics, you will be judged on the quality of that optics. So there was no uh, uh, kind of, we did not want to compensate on that as a parameter. And this is why much of that was really done, uh, designed, done mathematically. But after that, there is almost an era of full scopes. We started also thinking quite a lot about breaking the sets of assumptions. I remember at a point of time, which was not practical, but I'm assuming if I can find it, we started playing with some very strange things about our human eye, which is because the objectives are very small, I'm just gonna show here for a second and then pass it to you all. Uh, you can see, now, instead of one, there are two microscopes embedded in the same object, which is a little bit crazy to think about. We are actually using, because this is micro optics, you can project on the retina that are different from each other. And the maximum we got to is we actually had nine microscopes <laughs> embedded in parallel, which are projecting nine different images on the retina. And this was a Kind of an experiment in psychophysics in some sense of what is the what will the brain do uh, and again we were just playing with these sets of assumptions because we always assume when you look through an objective it's the same image Although even in a stereo microscope when the image is a little bit different you know you get a perception of three-dimensionality so here we were using to project both a fluorescence and a bright field image simultaneously uh, and uh, 
we played around with these sets of notions of how can we explore. And uh, of course, one of the other things we discovered, and I don't know if I have a picture of it, but I'll show it to you in a really fun, surprising way. So this was actually the very first grant that I wrote. I, you know, I couldn't be more clear of, I thought I was very proud of this. I thought, you know, integrated micro optics. We, we had plans of implementing many other things in paper. This is really early stages of paper microfluidics as well. And all of that gets incorporated in this. And we are now working on a product where we're implementing this micro optics in RDTs to actually use this as an approach, but to do these RDT reactions at a very small scale. And this all was literally in this image, but I couldn't get people excited about that image. But of course, when I ship a full scope, uh, you know, people understand that as a perspective. This is the kind of data. Now, this is kind of an important thing to remember is uh, you're watching individual, uh, these, the little dots that float by uh, are single bacteria. And of course, these are eupalotes. And we'll spend a lot of time today uh, to just get you to use the instrument. And some of you who do microscopy, my, this is actually a phase image. So there is an incredible amount of contrast that we are getting just from the object that I pass around that at this moment costs around $1.75 for anybody to make. So there's a lot of other optical tricks that have gone in and transitioning into the quality of data that you get. And I think, you know, you can watch as many of these videos as you want. Uh, the important part is for you to actually directly experience it. Uh, the other discovery that we made at that time, it's really fun from a design perspective. Uh, but going back to this image, and I'm going to see if the batteries are charged, uh, which I used to have here. Uh, but if uh, we started doing this first as just play, is if you attach a flashlight, which you can now do because you all have full scope, at the point where uh, you have your illumination, because it makes a real image on your retina, you can actually also project it on a surface. So what you're looking at in this kid is it's a projector. She's just using a cell phone as a flashlight, but you can just attach a regular flashlight. And it's projecting an image in what is a technique that has historically been known in microbiology as camera lucidia. Originally, before people had uh, actual sensors, you would just project an image on a surface and you literally draw. This is literally the history of all of the microscopy images that you might have seen in uh, micrographs are all drawn through this process. And one of the other things that ends up happening is that this type of an optical framework allows us to implement. So there are many communities that do night science where in the dark, you can literally project an image as large as you want on a surface as long as you have enough light or bright enough flashlight. Uh, that was the sort of a scenario of not knowing as an object, we wanted to make sure that it should not have dependence on power. So there is a regular way that people use full scope, which is just, uh, there's nothing attached to it. There is no electronics in the pouch that I gave you. If you have an electronics or an LED, you can mount that. All, my, all full scopes connect to a cell phone, but it was very important as a design criteria to not be dependent on a cell phone. And frankly, when I run, us. Uh, for full scope, I never take out my phone because if I take out my phone, that is an object that kids are attracted to rather, <laughs> you know, because it is also a marvel of technology. And I'm trying to decouple that because I can't leave my phone there, but I do actually uh, uh, get full scope to people. And then, of course, a third modality is this projection. There are a lot of artists. So, this is a fun little thing in which uh, uh, now I'll switch to talking about. Uh, but I do not know this person. This is a person, I think, that was living in Japan. Uh, and I'll tell you how we got these things to people. But I receive random objects in mail, and I'll pass this. Uh, uh, there's no explanation. There's nothing except it just said, oh, I have been keeping a journal using Foldscope, and I thought you would like it. And then they just ship that journal, and you actually see uh, drawings from made through a Foldscope that are represented in there. There's another object, which actually is very dear to me. Uh, this came from uh, 
uh, Richard, uh, and he is a bicyclist. And now I'm transitioning to talking about community. So I'm passing this object around. Or where is my camera? Your camera's here now. Sorry. Uh, this is another object that I received in mail, and it says "Fold and Unfold" by Richard Dorset. It's a self-published for a cyclist who started traveling in Laos, Cambodia, uh, Thailand for two years running full scope workshops for kids around the world. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'll tell you kind of how these sets of connections happen. But you can flip through this as an object. Uh, here's another one, which is associated with uh, this letter, uh, which is again, four letter, you guys can read that yourself. Uh, let me pass this around. And then I'm gonna transition to sort of what objects mean to you and what objects mean to other people. When we published this paper, uh, there was this notion of, okay, we have done this, this is valuable, but it was not very satisfactory. And the reason it was not satisfactory was this perspective that we were trying to build something that would enable this capacity globally. And from unless it could really be in people's hand, it meant nothing because this was not an academic exercise, which is again, a lesson to all of you as you're thinking about your projects. You, can, you definitely have to get to a point where you are convinced that technically this is the right way to do something. But beyond that, something has to change. And that is about access. And I made this really, at that moment, a bizarre decision with, with and I'm very thankful that he agreed with, he was still a graduate student with me. Uh, and I decided we're going to ship 70,000 full scopes to people around the world. Now, this is from a lab setting and I'll show you, I actually dug in that picture. I was able to find the picture of what our lab looked like when we made that decision. Uh, I also have the world's largest full scope here that I'll you in a second, uh, but these are from, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll walk through some of these fun pictures, but let me show you what our lab looked like uh, at the time we decided to manufacture uh, 75,000 fold scopes. Uh, I know it's hidden and uh, I thought I had it. Uh, oh, there it is. So you can see this. Uh, how do I hide this? Is there a way to hide? You can drag it around. Hide video panel? Floating meeting, the one below. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you can see uh, this is a picture from the lab at that time. Uh, Jim right there. <laughs> there are a couple other students. Um, there is a little machine that we had built at that time, and some of the videos of these machines still exist, which allowed us to do the assembly of this. And I think going back to now building communities, the purpose at that moment was that if we wanna convince ourselves of a project to have a global impact, even to convince ourselves that we can actually tie into this price point that we have been imagining, we had to prove it ourselves. Uh, I had $100,000 at that time from some of my startup funds. And then we asked with this much amount of money, how many full scopes we can make. And in the end, we actually ended up spending more money on shipping, which I'll talk about. Uh, then we received around 75,000 emails from people around the world because on our lab website, we had this thing, if anybody wants a full scope, just write to us a paragraph and then we will ship it and we, we would ship, I still remember to Sudan, it would cost $25 to just ship the thing. But it was very important to explore this idea of what would people do with it. There are a couple of rules that we applied. One is we won't tell people what to do. And I think this is a little bit of a divergence going back to impact. This idea that if this object is powerful window into the microscopic world, then we didn't want to taint people's opinion about what it is good for. And I'm going to go through a laundry list of ideas that I would have never imagined that people currently use Foldscope for. 
So it's a little bit about giving people a blank slate at the start because it's a capability. And unless they feel the sense of ownership of their bringing a new idea to the table, people don't react the same way. The second part of that was uh, we wrote this uh, kind of a summary associated with that once you are set up a community, there's a sense of a responsibility of sharing this capability with others. Because of course, our primary media of engaging with people was just the internet. But just because you have internet, you already realize how privileged that is. I mean, you know, in the end, not everybody can uh, even get access to information that's online. And that led to us finding people who were socially responsible in thinking about these ideas much more broadly. That led to the community at large. Uh, and I think one of the fascinating things that has been true to this day is sort of this mantra that I've often thought about is in any scientific capabilities that you think about, you can manufacture that capability, but you cannot manufacture mentors and people that will engage in bringing services on top of those technologies. This is true for healthcare. This is really true from a context you can have as many sequestration sets of technologies. You can really have as much of measurement of pollutants, unless you can engage with people that really drive policy, drive behavior, and really bring those in places around the world, you really have some things that will stay in isolation. So that was our moment of starting to think about how do we really engage and build mentors. And that seed of the first 70,000 people that joined the program, uh, till today, some of the anchors of what has led to the next scale up. And another thing that happens in this is this notion of uh, ownership. So I think one of the fascinating things to think about in that perspective is I just want to show a picture from a rural village in India, which I like. Um, here is a uh, uh, because we asked people to, so that's a community in Nigeria. I'll talk about uh, different sets of communities in a second. Uh, yeah, I cannot find that picture. Uh, that's Lagos. Uh, I like this picture. You kind of see the, uh, it has, uh, Professor Lucas, uh, and uh, that's just fold scope. Uh, that was just a joke, but uh, it's still a functional fold scope. Um, okay, I think, oh yeah, right here. Uh, that's kind of an interesting, uh, I don't know if you all re realize there's a social context to this. Um, this is the story of one individual that we met through the Foldscope community. This is a village in Velour, and the person's name that's behind here is Mo Pandiraj. And I think one of the things that I often, when I think about Foldscope community, I mean, Richard, the book that's passing around is another example. We often think about humans as rational beings that do certain sets of things, but they're also remarkable human beings on this planet whose capabilities are very hard for us to even imagine and think about. Like when we started and created this project, I didn't imagine that somebody in Seattle will quit what they're doing, pack thousands of full scopes, fly to Lagos and start biking for two years. That's just not how we think. But that is what the world is, that when people see how they give in this planet, uh, they give in different ways. And that leads to this picture, which is a picture from a village in Valur. Uh, I got an email from Mo Pandirajan. Uh, it was an email in Tamil. I don't speak Tamil. And the thread there was, I run a school. Would you send me some fold scopes? And you know, I dutifully replied and we shipped him some fold scopes. And I got that another message and I started shipping him fold scopes. I got to know him. Four years later, I got a message from him with an Excel sheet that had 12,000 names in it and another Excel sheet that had 95,000 names in it. And I was a little bit confused. It's like, what is going on? What does this mean? It was all in Tamil. He had 
four years, traveled across India, and he now is the most prominent or the most number of old school posts. Uh, he crossed me some time ago uh, of how many posts he has made in the community. And he literally every single day. So at this very moment, if I go online and find, I, I made Facebook friends with him. Uh, and then I could tell that he was literally running workshops. I did the math. He was running a full scope workshop for 50 kids every single day for four years in a row. And after English language, Tamil is the most spoken language in our community. And literally it's him spreading uh, an idea and capability. And of course, I realized that early on that he was literally superhuman. I mean, and this picture, and I think when you think about it, when we think about science and society, this is actually a religious ceremony. This is Rangoli for some of you who celebrate Diwali. And that's a microscope that he's creating in the context of Rangoli. Or if you go on a uh, full scope website, uh, you will see pictures of him uh, doing full scope workshops in a wedding, for example. Or he would travel and take the train, and he is literally running full scope workshops inside a train. To the kids that are actually selling, and I mean, you know, India still has some amount of child labor and other things. So you, it's very easy if you're traveling in India to find like a child selling something in the train. And that kid, he's spending some time with that kid, teaching him and giving him a full scope. And it's this notion of how we think about the world. And uh, so that's more right here. And one of the things that I find fascinating, again, this is, this is a nonlinear effect that exists in the world, why I'm still a little bit optimistic that there is hope on this planet, because I, in none of my models, none of my impact calculations, I ever put people like Mo. And I think, you know, I would say there are, in our community, maybe 20, 30 individuals like Mo. It's not exactly the same way of just the, the level of time and dedication to a cause, but on the other hand, these sets of individuals end up being the super users that transform how I might even perceive about the technology. And when I'm thinking about capabilities now, I am trying to get objects that we make soon in the hands of people, even before we have figured out what they are good for, even though we have figured out how we're going to tackle the sets of problems. Because, uh, I mean, one very famous example of him is he started going to vegetable stands and he would run full scope workshops at the, what would be the equivalent of the organic market that some of you go, but except he would do this in disguise where he would hang microscopic images in the middle of this uh, vegetable stand without any explanation. And random people would walk by and look at this strange image that they have never seen before. This is a printout of what they did with the full scope. And from that leads the conversation and then leads them to be interested in bringing science to somebody in that way. And I think, you know, these sets of, without him being in the community, I can't just sit here and imagine this is how we should have certain sets of conversations. And similar, read some of the things in Richard's book that he wrote here. You start realizing of how people connect with others is not something that you dictate. And this is what I often mean when I'm thinking about how do you transition ownership of existence of a project to a much broader group of people rather than it be centered around you? We don't dictate what people do. Our goal then is to give the most technically the best sets of capabilities at the lowest price, which becomes a big enough goal, but then really nurture a broader set of communities around it. And you know, one of the fascinating things for me has really been is supporting these communities. So I'll just give you a few sets of examples. Uh, first of all, these communities are spread around the world. Uh, this is an old map that I think I had shown you all. And much of this dark area is all Mo. Uh, program in India with the government of India, and I'll talk a little bit about pros and cons of working with the government. This really enabled us to think about very differently in how we would scale a technology. So for example, if you look at this, this was literally in a period of two years when this slide was made around 2018. These were the number of hubs. Each one of these sets of entities is thousands of instruments, thousands of people involved. And we started 
extra grant program, which allowed anybody, uh, you know, any kid in the country to get a $50 or $100 grant. That's a trivial amount of money, but it enables them to be thinking about a question. And many of these sets of workshops that run literally can range from 500 to 1,000 kids at a very large scale. And it starts to create this uh, structure in terms of what we call them as full scope fellows. And they uh, choose certain sets of applications. So, you know, one example of that program, for example, is we started a program around diagnostic capabilities in agriculture. Uh, there's a problem that they came about, which is a type of a fungus that has a huge impact in South India. And the goal really was how do farmers detect and identify that? Literally a piece of scotch tape, that object in 15 minutes, any farmer at this point can identify these things. And this is literally a tribal village in South India running that training program. It's all run through this, uh, you know, it's their idea. They are running the entire framework. They build the service around it. A kid or an adult in that community can charge a certain amount of money so he can go visit. There's a similar program that's being built right now for goats. Uh, there's a goats is a, is a final currency if you think about how livestock is actually used. And one of the frameworks to think about is to just focus on how do I enable an individual to initiate and start uh, a service on top of a technology that you've been building. And all of this is kind of word to mouth. We don't structure it uh, primarily because they get to dictate uh, in terms of how they would like to build and design, whether something would be built as a for-profit, would they build something that is uh, primarily educational, or whether they would build some kind of an hybrid model in terms of also sustaining. We do support around uh, uh, several groups of people in terms of financially uh, supporting if somebody is uh, engaged in these types of full scope activities over a global scale. But that is actually a very small portion compared to the volunteer groups that do this work. Uh, I'm going to stop here and take questions at this point. But just to give you kind of academic context of this, there's a joke that I want to mention. Uh, I had a colleague of mine ask me this question again at Stanford. It's like, you know, this is very exciting, but why are you shipping all these full scopes? I'm sure you're gonna write like some fun paper on community science and everything. And, you know, I just, my response was, this is the right thing to do. We have a capability. Uh, so we've just written one paper on full scope, which described there's roughly around 400 papers across the world on areas, you know, all the way from biodiversity mapping in the context of education, agriculture, diagnostic, human health, animal health, public health and awareness. There are randomized trials on sanitation programs. Uh, there are contexts in terms of just miscellaneous work that uh, like Nigeria, there is a group that came up with a way of detecting fake currency uh, using Foldscope. Uh, there is a program around uh, thinking about you can detect fake drugs uh, because fake drugs is a huge issue. And there's a micro encapsulation program uh, that's used in making certain kind of drugs that you cannot fake because that process is more difficult. Uh, things and ideas that I would have not uh, neither have the expertise in nor have imagined in the confines of this campus. And I think this is again goes back to this notion of sometimes we are thinking that we are solving somebody's problem. It's far more powerful to build the capabilities. Don't try to own or vertically integrate everything as a solution, but share those capabilities as soon as possible. Even at an extent where we didn't know whether we could manufacture the tool, we shared it with a very large group of people. And that's also builds the sense of trust. It builds this notion that other people bring something completely new to the table that you are willing to admit was not your idea. And at that same time, it, it builds a sense of community where people are training each other because frankly, every single time I've gone into a WHO conversation, when we talk about microscopy, everybody says, who's gonna train? And our answer to that is literally the, you know, it's, a, it's almost like a chain reaction, like PCR, once you're trained. And so I think one thing I'm going to do, I will train all of you in using a full scope, as long as you promise to train at least one more person 
or at least two more people for that chain reaction to continue. That's really what matters in terms of how capabilities propagate. You know, it is really about a skill set. And then you will realize that you think you are doing something for someone. And in that conversation, you will learn and realize that you are learning so many things along the way. And so I think this is kind of why when I think about projects, I just write to people in my community and I can literally write to the Ministry of Education Palau or the Ministry of Education in Leone or write to a farmer in Cambodia because they're all part of our community and get real time feedback. And we've been able to use what we learned in full scope communities to also layer many other projects on top of it. Because in the end, what is common about this community is people passionate about science and sharing science. And microscopy happens to be where we started. And the vision really is to have a much larger group of capabilities. And in a couple of when we talk about diagnostics, there is a similar vision we are trying to build on molecular uh, biology effective. How do we really get people to do what we can do with optics, but now with molecules? Another layer on top, which Anton and Anissa and a couple people in the lab are working, how do we build this type of a layer of community being on the driving seat on the biomaterial side of that process or sustainable material side of that process? Where we are enabling a certain kind of a process, but not focusing and channeling it where it's a very well-defined project. It's very hard to do because it is not a good story you can tell somebody who's trying to fund where you say, if you fund this project, we will train X, Y, Z number of people in this specific skill. Until today, I am not of the proponent of writing lesson plans for classrooms because every classroom is different. The teachers know an incredible amount about their students. We want to so there is a website that allows, uh, you know, if you go on microcosmos.foldscope.com, uh, this is an old slide, but one of the fun things about this image is there's somewhere of 20, 25,000 experiments that people have documented that are all on this site. And, you know, these experiments might be from a, you know, 50 year old professor in a university or a six-year-old kid, and they're right next to each other. This is another context of thinking about anybody and everybody that comes into the fold of science is starting at a different place, and you have to be respectful of that. So we're not trying to judge anybody. Uh, this is not an uh, imaging competition for that matter, that you're able to post the most beautiful image of the microscopic world, which is kind of what Nikon does. I mean, you have to realize that comes with a lot of privilege, the fact that you've had the capacity and you've been exposed ideas uh, and that type of uh, sets of tools and so now if we were to just literally go on micro this is the new site that we're about to launch but i'll show that in a second uh, oh what happened to my zoom uh, i think okay it's yeah, there yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's uh that's bio e 80s oh this is actually a, a under isn't this a class that you guys take yeah, yeah it seems like they're also using full scopes uh, <laughs> and kind of one of the fun things about this for example is i just clicked it this showed up in april 25 i know muhammad because i know him he started the first full scope club in iraq and this is literally a post coming from iraq and he's talking about uh, what he did Night shift street activity was dark already when I left home, walking aimlessly, hopefully to find some kids. So he literally has a bag of full scope and he's walking around in a street in Iraq looking for kids to share this. Since I was late that day, I tried to come up with more appealing access to pass because I had a long day and it was already getting dark, blah, blah, blah. What did I do? I embraced that voice inside me and showed care by promising myself to have enough rest after the activity. But then I had to deal with this new kind of uncertainty and suspected it'll be trickier to do the activity at nighttime. I think you have to understand this. He's been documenting his activities in Iraq for many years. And very recently, he's been very open in his voice about how he shares his work and also shares his vulnerabilities. 
And one of the things that he discovered along the way is because the sense of trust gets depleted. I mean, this was a war zone several years ago. So what he's describing here that uh, this to do an activity at nighttime, what he's really subtly actually saying is that when he reaches a kid, it's not so clear whether they will actually trust him. Uh, and this is a huge problem when you think about conflict zones and trying to bring science. And of course, he goes on and on. And uh, these are literally pictures, essentially. So if I zoom in with him, within an, a couple of hours, uh, he might have run these, uh, this workshop. And uh, I think kind of one of the threads that ends up happening. So I'm seeing this for the first time, essentially, and I'm trying to figure out what is going on. Uh, and of course, you know, I have never met Mahmoud. I know him from the community. So let's just go back. And uh, I guess I can see the bio E80. This is physiology 112. I don't know. I think uh, where, I don't know which place this class is. Uh, uh, it has no hint on it. This could be a class, ecology class at Princeton. This is physics 112. Yeah, this is all uh, different locations. Uh, I'll just keep going. But one of the threads here is that this is almost infinite. This is, I know this is Tamil. I can still can't read it, but I know it's Tamil. And I, yeah, I know Eden. Uh, that's, so that's data set just coming from Mo. And essentially, this is a very clever trick that he came up with, which is he paints nail polish on a leaf, things that are opaque you can make them transparent by making a mold. So this is tomato cells. You can see this tomato was open and you make a nail polish, you paint it, then you make a slide and he's imaging. And I think it's, uh, there's a tons of things that he's been doing in this space. Uh, and again, I don't know whether it was him or someone in that community that created that account. Uh, it's a fun picture. Uh, I am curious what's <laughs> happening here. Uh, <laughs> you cannot see from the side. So I, I really do find that hilarious. This was <laughs> April 15. Oh, that really is a really, uh, another joke that we often think about. Let me see where this is. Oh, this is also from Iraq, actually. Uh, this is also Mo. Yeah, that's the image. <laughs> uh, and I think, you know, you have to embrace the social side of this and a little bit of the unknown. And so, you know, here's a lesson on how to draw in real time. And I mean, this is infinite in the sense that if I was to just Google a name of a country uh, and microcosmos, I would find, uh, this is a fun one. I know this, uh, this is Melanie running full scope workshops currently in Senegal. So this is close to Dakar. And I think I can't read this, but from looking at well, the question is why is the lake red? You can see that the lake is blood red and that comes from this organism, but they're actually literally testing that on the boat. And this is again, a couple of days ago. Uh, so I think one of the messages that I wanna communicate is uh, a notion or a sense of community. Uh, there are hundreds of species that people have described. A few of them have also made it into the academic back where people discovered an object from Foldscope and then published it as a new species. There's a new species of cyanobacteria. That's Yash. He's been on an expedition all across the Himalayas looking for new species of tardigrades that live in really high altitudes, uh, tardigrades being one of the most common and fun objects. That actually is a picture from uh, the Amazon. And this is a piranha. I don't know how somebody <laughs> got that in their hands. But I didn't know this. You actually eat piranhas, although this is literally that same fish. If you were to fall in, you would be eaten alive. <laughs> There's a full scope post on the tooth of a piranha. Like what's so special uh, that, uh, but again, going back to thinking about these are, I mean, that's another picture from Brazil. These are the guardians of our biodiversity in some sense. And I think what I find ironic sometimes is unless that sense of science doesn't land in the hands of these individuals, it is very difficult to think about here making a claim of, oh, we should conserve biology while they have so little access to the frontiers of biology and the promises of biology. So there is this sense of honesty in this process of uh, 
rather than telling this is not science communication i think one thing that people sometimes miss full scope as oh it's a really great outreach project that's not what it is at all it is literally flipping this process around of what i find in i believe many of those folks would find interesting too and so our role is to give that tool share what we find interesting and then get out of the way and again the platform is much more of a voice for a broader group of people uh, and again it's something that we have to be honest about uh, so this is another example there's a program in india associated with applications of full scopes in conservation biology i mentioned to all of you a program around uh, uh, gorillas in Congo and Uganda. I just heard from Gladys. I accidentally met her last week. She just won the Edinburgh medal uh, for her work uh, on conservation. And I think it's been really fascinating to think about the human animal side of this process. Uh, I'm gonna stop here. There are thousands of examples, but I think maybe I'll end with this picture, which will, uh, what time is, oh, Wow, it's almost time for the class to end. I was thinking we're after this, we're gonna actually, uh, I don't have to teach you how to build this. This is something that you should do as night science when you go home. I'll tell you the resources to get started, but next lecture, we'll pick that up. I'll definitely do some demos for you. But I wanna leave you all with this picture. I think, you know, this is a picture that inspires me, but also makes me sad sometimes. Uh, and the, of course, the inspirational part is obvious, the village, that Mo is from, he clicked this picture. Uh, this is in rural Tamil Nadu. And you can see, I mean, I can sometimes hear the voices of these children in a line lining up uh, to see a new world. But sad, the reason it makes me sad is there are 2 billion kids. And after 10 years of work, we've been able to share this tool with 2 million kids. But that's not enough. I mean, that is a drop in the ocean if you really were to think about the breadth of a challenge. And if it's gonna take another 10 years to get to a couple million, uh, that is just too slow. And so one of the things that I've been thinking about is another layer of exponential in both training capacity, larger scale engagements. Uh, and again, you cannot do that without governments. And so there is a grassroots things that we have already built on, but there is a, that's the bottom up. Most of the time I talked about the bottom up but at this point, we have done literally thousands and thousands of pilots. And at this point, we have to switch to build programs that are top down, where you would literally say, OK, I have these many sets of kids in a given community. Uh, how do we really make sure that access to science from the sense of experience would be accessible to the entire population? Uh, it's, not a, it's not a role of funding, per se. It's a role of imagination for people to strongly believe of value, curiosity, we don't put a price on it. We often think about, you know, again, many entities have programs, even in the US, in trying to get kids to solve problems like, oh, you know, 15, 20 year olds working on cancer in their high school. And there's a lot of excitement for that. We praise them for thinking about science fairs, uh, but we don't provide them enough sense of just wonder. And because, you know, how do you, the government to say, hey, I'm going to just support people to be curious. And that's sort of what makes me sad in some sense is that although it has amplified and scaled, it hasn't scaled to the point where we would like to. And sometimes the process of curiosity, we really don't put as much value as we should really do that. So I'll end there. Um, and then I'm around if you have questions and threads. Uh, uh, as a homework, of course, I want everybody to have a functional fold just a quick uh, thing on that. It's trivial if you just go full scope tutorial. Uh, it is actually worth watching the process in video. There are hundreds of videos in any kind of language that you want uh, that you can just see through in terms of thinking about the basics. And then when you guys are ready, I'll do some advanced sets of things of. Uh, uh, there's all kinds of experiments that we can think and do, but it's actually very important for all of you, if you want to truly understand this object, to go through this process, uh, kind of a, get a sense of uh, where you're stuck, 
watch uh, uh, a couple of videos. Uh, do follow these videos in terms of assembly, uh, but there's nothing you can do wrong. Uh, so you have to be fearless in some sense. You can make a mistake in that process, go backwards, fix it forward again, but push yourself. So the assignment is come up with one creative experiment that you think is truly unique uh, before you come uh, on Wednesday in the class. So it doesn't count like, oh, I just looked at my hair. That's being lazy. <laughs> come up with something truly unique that surprised you. So start with an object that you really don't know what you're about to find. So onions don't count because you've seen onion cells. You have to surprise yourself and play with it a little bit until you get to a point like, wow, I had not imagined that this is how this object works. So this is how this phenomena works. And because of microscopy, uh, I was able to poke at it. And I think I'll help you with that process a little bit because one thing you have to do with these sets of tools and the capabilities is also to be a little bit uninhibited in your own ways and forms of thinking itself. So use that excuse to break a mold. Uh, think about one crazy idea that nobody in the class would think of. So stretch your imagination as far as possible. And then on the next class, I'll actually show you how 10 year olds beat you by a mile. <laughs> so, That's okay. the, if you can beat the 10 year olds, see what you can do. Yeah, I, I can <laughs> guarantee you, it is almost <laughs> impossible for any, like some of the examples of what has gone in a full scope is just my thing. And so, but I think, you know, you should try. So I'm gonna say bye to the folks online. Uh, I realize I kind of went uh, over time, but I think I'll pick up some of the questions from the community uh, in terms of uh, next time that we pick up. And I see Yash is already in the audience. Uh, Yash, great to see you. Yash is the, the crazy person that drives around in mountain bikes looking for tardy grades. Is that <laughs> Yash, it must be really late for you. Okay, I think, yeah. Hey, Manu. hey everyone, yeah, it's quite late. It's quite <laughs> uh, thanks for connecting. Go back to sleep. I'll see you at 10 p.m. Uh, my time tonight. I think uh, Tyler must have sent a note for the global community side, just a quick chat, side chat tonight. Mm -hmm. okay. Bye everyone. Take care.